So my name is Julian Bardwaj. I'm a data scientist at PayPal. And a couple of things. So if you were thinking Monica was going to be on the screens, no. If you were thinking I'm going to talk about ICU and all the cool stuff that Sri just mentioned, again, no. So a little bit of a letdown. But I'm hoping you still find all this uh, interesting. So um, over yesterday's talks, we, we heard from Mark um, about the cool stuff he's, uh, H2O has been doing with random forests and GDM. And uh, what I'm going to show you here is a real-world application of, of how PayPal's used that machine learning algorithm to get actual significant results and how we've, um, how we've implemented it. So, so here we go. Um, churn. Um, like Brandon was saying, churn is a big deal. Um, and once you Google it, you realize that there are a million definitions. There's churn for subscription businesses. There's, there's e-commerce churn and, and, and just a, a world of different thought processes around that. So um, some of the things that we've done at PayPal that made it, um, that made it resonate with our um, consumer base and our uh, leadership team is, is, um, is what I'm showing today. Um, let me take you guys back just you know, a few months ago as to how we in our organization thought about churn. Um, so really, um, when, you, when you say you, you want to know if a consumer or a customer churned or not, it's usually looking at their activity, uh, whether it's transaction activity or visits to the site or some sort of engagement. Um, and how they um, and how they stop doing that for a short period of time. So a couple of nuanced items there um, were were the way we were defining it. One, we looked at it at a transaction basis. So if somebody stopped transacting with our business, then that's a churn for uh, for a period of time. And when we did that, we said if they stopped transacting last, say, ten days ago we would assign uh, their churn date as today because we found that they actually had not transacted today. In reality, it would be closer to the truth if we went back to say they churned when they did their last transaction for two reasons. One, it's an assumption that it's probably that interaction that caused a negative experience or something around that, uh, that last interaction. Two, when we superimpose win back campaigns, they all mesh together. So when you see a curve going up, when reactivation or activation happens, and you superimpose that with the actual churn date, those volumes match up. So that was one. Um, and, and the other was um, looking at the actual churn period. It's very easy, especially in a big organization, to say, hey, we're going to set this period to be X number of days or X number of months and then go after it. And if that period turns out to be really long, like say three years, um, it's, it's just too much to wait three years and then say, oh, we know this guy turned three years ago. That's, you know, at that point, it's too late to, to get them back. So that's when uh, really the power of machine learning comes in. And we can say the minute somebody does a transaction, we can predict in the next five days or five minutes or two weeks that this person's going to stay with us for the, for the next whatever period or not. And that is really, really powerful because it allows you to engage that person in, their, in what we think their last, last uh, interaction with the company is. Um, and that's where, uh, that's where we've used uh, machine learning. Um, I'm also, so that's, that's, gen, that's the general problem statement. Um, and when we went through the implementation steps of this, um, I'm sure people tell you, you need to kind of know what your end product looks like. It's going to change and evolve along, along the way, but you have to have an idea. So this was um, the output that we said uh, would resonate the most with all our stakeholders. So what this is, um, I know the font is small and all that good stuff, but this, this is the redacted customer ID. So I can't really share you know, consumer IDs in public forum, but um, that's our customer ID. Um, and all the way at the end is actually a score 
So it says this customer, this first customer on the first row, has that particular uh, probability of churning in the given time period. Um, that table that you see all the way over there simply explains that. It's, it's a customer number. That's their probability of churn. And this middle portion, which, uh, which, which we had to, to do some development work um, with, actually shows um, what feature um, caused that particular high or low score. So um, I'll get into that in depth a little more, but in a tree-based model, um, you know overall if you score something for 100 consumers, it'll give you feature importances, normalized feature importances like you saw um, in Mark's talk yesterday. Um, that applies to the entire consumer base. So if this particular feature that I have here, that says the month of prior transaction, um, if that shows up as a top feature, that's gonna apply to all the consumers. So the challenge is really connecting that to each individual value of each consumer to then come up with a segment that you can then uh, cut geographically or by product usage and then uh, you know, um, do your action, whatever action that, that turns out to be. So I'll, I'll pause there and I'll go into, into a little depth of how we got that segment. But before that, um, when we were in the, in the planning stages of this, we knew what the end product was gonna look like. We now needed to know what, who our audience is. So it's like, it's broadly split into these. Um, for this to be successful, um, really, instead of a bottoms up approach, like I think H2O World has taken, we did top down. We went to the executive team, said, hey, this is, our, this is what we're thinking. Uh, do we have your buy-in? And it wasn't simply that, it was showing a lot of um, you know, reactivation curves and, and showing data on how transaction patterns looks inside of PayPal to actually get the buy-in. But what we found was executives are executives. They want to see things that are aggregated up to a higher level. Um, we want to see the forest and the trees um, because we're operational folks, but at, at a higher level to see what the impact of the business is that is important. Also, um, if you have a, 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 an organization and you have lots of people rallying around one, one common cause, you need to have a consistent metric. So I might look at a subset of consumers, um, say 100 consumers in this pocket, and say, hey, these people are, have a very different transaction pattern. I can tell you uh, that for them, the right metric would be three hours, you know within three hours if they churned or not. Um, and this other population of people that don't quite transact that frequently, for them, um, maybe three months. So that sort of thinking, while valuable to us, doesn't resonate. You can't have an organization with like 18 different churn period definitions or churn definitions. Um, so you've got to keep one um, that works for everybody. And the nice thing is that's not quite operational. The important piece is that you can predict how quickly you can predict if a person's gonna churn or not. Um, so those were some lessons learned. So um, when you're looking at building metrics, say, um, think of it as one that you present out to everybody that you can run your KPIs and understand the long-term health of the business and if that's going up or going down or, or steady or whatever that is. And another operational component that actually goes to our digital marketing analysts or to our product people that actually has individual level probabilities that, that can then be actioned. So those are the two big personas. I've called them executive and marketing and analysts. We're all easy. All we need is just point me to the data, point me to the table or the partition where the data is and I'm good to go. So that's, that's pretty much all we had to do. Um, so, so given those two pieces, we actually started hitting this up. And what this really shows is, is a um, list of, of tools that we use and lessons learned. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip over this a little quickly. Um, so EDA, I'm sure all of you are super familiar. That was also our first step. Um, you can see the, the tools that we used. Um, Python was big, um, I love Python comfort levels high, and anything you want to put in a sort of process, 
um, Python is great, you know, compared to R. If you want to say, I want my modeling data set with one customer in each row and like a zillion features at the end, um, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to want to drop the table. So Python just makes it easier. Kick it off before you go home, and by the time you get home, it's probably done. Or worst case, by the time you come back next morning. Um, so that was good. Another key thing I learned was um, transactional information, super useful. High, really, really high predictive power for this use case. Uh, the next one was behavioral data, things like clickstream. You know, maybe you have Omniture, maybe you have something that's homegrown. That's big. Um, not quite as much as transaction data, but still. Um, demographic, like, like zip codes or What's the square footage of your home? Um, not really. So after like the initial maybe one day of working with it, I just dropped it and went ahead. And it turned out to be, be a, a good decision. Second piece, I'll move over to, to modeling. Um, we st I, I didn't even try using like a logistic regression. We jumped straight into random forest. Um, it's just it's a great all-around algorithm. And so um, ensembles. Huge fan of ensembles. Uh, and actually, we're in uh, production today with, with both. We, we look at Random Forest and we look at GBM and, and then see what, what wins for that particular uh, time frame and then use that. Um, and, and the big tools we use here are really R and H2O. Um, I say R, I was just using H2O through R. So the, so the key portion here was really H2O. Um, and production, um, also, one big lesson that I learned was um, get to production quickly. So if you have a model with decent predictive power, get that out, you know, so you, since your marketing teams might have a good lead time, it might take time to get the creative or any media out, um, get that out and then iterate to get things better. Um, so, and, and at the end when we actually went live with a good, um, uh, good model for the MVP. Um, these were uh, some of the metrics. So pretty good prediction, right? You know, right out the box um, with, with a good number of features um, with H2O's just default selections for both Random Forest and for GBM, uh, you get really good values. Um, and, and some of the things I did was use um, five-fold cross-validation and then take all that data and actually use a validation um, data set that's outside the time frame to actually give you, um, you know, to prevent any overfitting type of issues. Um, and here, I think, is the slide that H2O wants me to really show, and I'm really proud of what H2O has done with this, too. Um, up at the top, you see uh, the software that I used and, and the evolution of how modeling on just my laptop or, or a really big virtual machine um, still took me a long time. And I was working off of sample sizes of hundreds of thousands of rows. Um, and then all the way down at the bottom, if you see the last piece, I don't even know how, how many gigs of RAM there was, but um, I trained and, and scored on not like a sample size, but the entire population, and it was orders of magnitude faster. So that's, that's kudos to H2O, just the way it does things in multi-processes and multi-threads. The results that you get are really awesome. And I want to pause here for a second, because what it really meant to us was uh, any other, even you know, anything other than H2O, these, these scoring times and modeling times are really high. So if we wanted to say, run more than one model on a data set and actually provide output, uh, we couldn't. We'd, we'd just make the cut for, I, I just get everything under the door in the last possible minute. So run a random forest, get the output of the marketing folks, and then wait. Whereas now, I can run a random forest, a GBM, a random forest with different, differently tuned um, hyperparameters and several different um, GBMs to, to get you know, a model that wins. Um, and the other reason this was important was um, actually getting uh, features. So um, this is something uh, that, that I think goes a little uh, more than simply getting an output. So you guys know whenever we do a tree-based modeling approach, 
actually saying per row, per consumer, to say this is the feature that actually uh, resulted in your high or low value, um, that's a little difficult. The way we did it initially was take these normalized feature importances that H2O throws out as percentages, um, normalize the actual variables, and then multiply them to say, okay, this is the impact, whatever, you know, whatever the highest number is that wins. Um, that's okay for an MVP, but that's, and for segmentation, it's okay, but that's, uh, we'd like to go, you know, one step farther and actually do it the right way, which I think um, is what we ended up doing. And only H2O enables that because of the speed at which it, it processes um, the data. Um, and that approach is really, say you have your model and it's got five features, um, you run your output. So you get consumer one with these five features has a score of 90%. Um, you take away one feature, so just set it to nulls, set it to NAs, run the model again and see the difference in, in your output. From a 0.9, did it go to a 0.8? Okay, that's one data point. Um, and then run it again with, with another feature dropped. And that way when you run it across all features, um, you get the output and, and the difference in the output, just the magnitude of the difference will tell you what feature really popped for that one person. Um, very useful and very accurate because there are certain consumers with certain special cases that would come in, the decision trees would, would send them one way or another, but because the volume is so small of these special cases, it gets lost when the results are aggregated um, at, the, at the random forest or a GBM level. So that's something we did. Hopefully you guys can um, use that for in your world as well. So anyways, end result, um, successful. I, I can't really stand here and share dollar amounts with you, but I just believe me, my boss is very happy with me. Um, so that's good. We've, some proxies for how successful this has been is really the resource commitments, you know, across various different teams that are helping with this. Um, so that's one proxy. The other proxy that says this is a success is um, some of the outputs, some of the key features that came out of these models have been built into a framework that, that we use to segment the entire, you know, entire consumer base. So that was a win as well. So really, what we do matters. That's all, folks. Thank you. All right, we've got a few minutes, so if anybody wants to answer, ask some questions, we can uh, field a few, and we'll have some people walk back with some mics. All right, we'll start up here. Maybe I missed something, but I didn't see the word clustering mentioned on the slides. Could you talk about whether you're using clustering to first bucket the users before you try to predict churn? Uh, you mean clustering the users based on their behavioral patterns? Based on everything, behavioral patterns, the general demographic attributes, whatever other things you can. So could you just talk about whether you look at clustering, are you using it, what have you found about its usefulness? Um, sure, sure. So, uh, yes, I, we didn't go through that, but um, one of the goals when we started was, was also to segment them accurately so we could, we could not only get the score but also message them and, 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 and really uh, find out what is driving this behavior. Um, and um, I used flat R for that and, and just a k-means clustering to, to get the output. Um, more static, and that never really became a bottleneck. So, you know, I didn't talk about this, but nothing big there. We did build it into, we did come up with clusters, and some of what you saw here when we ended up using the random forest on this was actually building a model for each cluster to make that a little more accurate. And that was a, a, a next step uh, over and above the MVP. Yeah? We've got one there. Oh, sorry. So yeah, a uh, very interesting presentation. I just had a question about the last part where you worked on the feature importance. So sure. this was like, in addition to the random forest producing the most important variables, you also wanted to know for that particular customer which variable was impactful for his churn. 
Correct. Yes, um, that's exactly what it was. Um, and again, to help with further segmentation and messaging of this. So essentially, person. you had to score him multiple times with how many other features you had. You had to like essentially go through each one, drop each one, and then score score again. Yep, that's right. And and I know I glazed through this, but if you look at the last line, right, the the scoring. Um, Okay, the last line says scoring took five minutes for, um, for the entire consumer base. The actual uh, spitting out the score was a minute, and I.O. took the, the rest of the time. So it got us to a point, the speed of it got us to a point where even if we had 60, 70 features, I could just loop and run through all this and then subtract and, and get the biggest. Uh, so if you had like variable. one million customers and 60 features, so it would be like 60 million scoring. Yes, okay. that's true. Okay. All yeah, right. that, that is what we did. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Hey, I think we have time for one more, and we've had somebody grab a mic. So okay. go ahead. So I'm just uh, curious uh, when you put them um, uh, doing the, this uh, random forest, it definitely, how do you consider the time variable? Because, like, for that specific customer, Within the next three hour, the probability will definitely be different from within the next three years. So, how do you consider this time variable just to put into like each model? Like this model is for three three hour, and the second model is for like one year. And the, I, I'm just curious how you put this time variable. Okay, let me see if I understand correctly. Um, so. If you're saying, um, if I run c uh, consecutive uh, runs of the same model, but then churn the, uh, change the churn period from minutes to hours, uh, how that impacts, is that your question? Yeah, how, the, yeah, how you uh, treat we, this We didn't, we, we fixed uh, a churn period for like the entire consumer base. Um, okay, so just uh, fix the time period. Uh huh. And the only thing that changed, like a model run from today to tomorrow, um, is if a consumer in this time period actually had an interaction with, with the company, that would change some of the features, but that's about the change there was. Okay. okay. Um, actually, I, I don't know if I answered your question, and I got a one minute left thing. Can we chat right after? I'm happy yeah. to walk okay. through all of this. Thank you. Okay, cool, thank you. Thank you very much.